And on the call today, we've got six different um, team members. We've got Drew Snyder, the uh, certified financial planner. He's the director of financial planning here at Coastal. Uh, he's going to be presenting the information and, and helping us with the Q&A afterwards. You've also got myself and Jonah Kaufman, two of the financial advisors on the team. We're going to serve as your chat advisors, helping to answer any questions you might have during the presentation. We have Evelina Kaplap, who is our, uh, our wealth management operations manager. She's our webinar host, the DJ, and the event support. Uh, she's the one that's putting all this together. If you have any technical issues today while you are listening to the presentation, Direct message Evelina and she'll, she'll make sure uh, you're taken care of. We also have Tiffany DeBose and Sam Bogocek on the call with us today. They're our event support. If you'd like to schedule any time with the financial advisors after the event, message Tiffany or message Sam, message Sam and they'll help you out with scheduling a time. With that, Drew, I'm going to turn the microphone over to you and let you get it started. Thanks a lot, Rick, uh, for that introduction. And I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. Um, I'm really excited to present college planning, college funding. Um, it's a topic near and dear to my heart. I have a eighth grader um, and ever since she was born, I've thought about this um, topic and um, I'm excited to share my experiences with everyone today um, that I've had in planning for my daughter's college, saving for it. And then, you know, there's just a few years left, it seems. It's getting closer. And um, and then eventually we're going to have to pay for it. So uh, we're going to cover both of those topics today. We're going to start with saving for college and then um, transition into the um, how do you pay for it. Um, and also. Um, when we do our financial planning here, and I've been a financial planner for 20 years, I've uh, been at Coastal for 15 years, and um, what I find often is is that everyone's pretty focused on their retirement, and um, and college planning kind of takes a uh, backseat to retirement planning, and unfortunately, we've seen situations where people have uh, realized that they got a little bit behind the eight ball on college planning, but they're doing a great job getting for their uh, getting ready for their retirement. So today, hopefully what we'll help you do is um, uh, strike a balance between uh, all your goals that you have, giving you some information about the best ways to save for college and then some of the tools available to help you figure out how to pay for it. Uh, you know, as parents, we put a ton of energy into our kids, right? And um, getting them to school, back to school, um, especially these days. I know a lot of families are at home uh, with their kids and helping them. And uh, we're putting a lot of energy into our kids' education um, and helping them get to their extracurricular activities so they're well-rounded people and good citizens. And um, then one day they're going to get accepted to their college of choice. And what I hope is that everyone on this call today is going to have um, some preparation so that when those kids get that acceptance letter or email, however it comes these days, um, that you'll be able to, um, to get them to that school and everyone's going to be happy. Um, You should have received a workbook by email, and uh, that workbook is actually really excellent. It's got a lot of information and data um, that we're going to be covering today in this presentation. Uh, but I hope you have pen and uh, paper handy because I'm going to go beyond that a bit and um, share some some information that I've gathered. Um, and please, um, first of all, um, I have a green screen behind me because I'm actually in my eighth graders uh, bedroom and uh, no one wants to see what's behind that. Uh, but also, I just want to say that um, uh, you know, there's there's so much um, information out there, and um, and so hopefully today we can kind of parse it down into what you need to be doing. Okay, I might be looking down at my notes because I did take a, a number of notes to make sure I gave you the most current information today uh, that goes beyond the um, the presentation. So let's start off with um, uh, whoops. Okay. Sorry, let's see. There we go. Um, saving for college. So here's the cost of college today uh, nationally on an average. Uh, Four-year public school, as you can see, is just under 22000 and um, 
just under 50000 for a four-year private university. Um, I went ahead and, and dug up the information for a couple local schools you might have heard of. Uh, university of... Um, um, uh, Chapel Hill, um, UNC Chapel Hill. Um, right now, it, all in, you're looking at $24,000 if you go uh, tuition, room and board, uh, books and fees and a few other costs that they added in um, when I looked at their website. And uh, at Duke, it's uh, 75000 So, um, you know, obviously Duke is an elite college or university and uh, like a lot of the Ivy League schools, uh, Stanford and some of the other small private colleges, you know, you're definitely looking at $70,000 um, for the full tuition. What's interesting, though, and what I think um, you might find interesting is that what people actually pay for college tuition and room and board is not the full sticker price for most people. Um, if you have your pen handy, write down this website. I found it really interesting. It's called uh, collegescorecard.edu.gov. And if you go to that website, what you'll find is, is that you can look up a college or university and it will tell you given your income range, how much you might pay. So just as an example, I, I wrote down Duke and UNC's numbers. Um, so for example, if you have an income between 75 and $110,000, uh, last year, someone would pay about $19,000 to go to UNC. If your income is over $110,000, you'd be paying the full $24,000. Now, let's compare that to Duke, which I found extremely interesting. That same couple who has seventy five to one hundred and ten thousand or that same family of income would only pay fifteen thousand dollars to go to Duke. So it's actually cheaper to go to Duke than it is to go to UNC, assuming you can get into both colleges and uh, and that's your income range. Now, if you go a hundred and over one hundred and ten thousand dollars, Duke then jumps up to forty five thousand dollars. OK, so but what you can do is go to that website and look at the university or college that your kid is interested in. And you can kind of see that um, I found it very interesting. Drew, can you repeat that link for me so I can put it in the chat for everybody? Yeah. College scorecard dot edu dot gov. So it's provided by uh, the Department of Education. Got it. Okay, I'll work on that. Thank you so much. Keep Thanks, Evelina. Thank so as we all know, the um, cost of college is going up uh, more rapidly than inflation or pretty much any other cost, quite honestly. Um, and this slide shows us the projected cost at a 5% inflation rate um, for public and private universities. Um, so what's important about this for everyone to know is as we're talking about different ways to save for your college or uh, your kid's college, um, it's important to understand that the cost of college does go up more than regular inflation. So how you invest your money is really important if you want to be able to keep pace with that 5 to 6% inflation rate. For us, uh, as a financial planners, um, it really starts with uh, creating a goal. And not every family's goal is going to be to pay for 100% of a four-year university, four-year uh, Duke tuition, right? I mean, that is out of reach for I would say you know 95% of uh, American households. But it is important as you are um, thinking about what you want it for your children. Uh, to do to have that goal and understand how much if you save on a monthly basis is going to get you to um, uh, to that goal. Um, this assumes a six percent rate of return. Obviously, if we're using a five or six percent inflation rate, then we're just basically keeping pace with the rising cost of college, which is important, of course. So here are the primary uh, college savings options that we see. Um, the top two uh, are um, the 529 plan, which many people have heard of. And then second is, well, truthfully, the number one um, account used for saving for college for most families across the country is a savings account, earning now probably less than 1%. Um, the second 
fire and in terms of usage. Um, we're going to talk about each one of these types of accounts as we move through the presentation. What I want everyone to understand, though, is three of these have tax benefits. That's the 529 plan, the Coverdell Education Savings Account, and also Roth IRAs. Um, and we'll talk about the um, advantages and disadvantages of using those accounts going forward. But having that tax advantage, if you think about it, when you're trying to keep pace with a 5 or 6% inflation rate, the more money that you keep for yourself that doesn't go to taxes helps you reach that goal a lot easier. So that's important to keep in mind. And this shows us the difference between saving in a um, like a 529 plan that has that tax deferral and tax exempt status and a regular taxable account. Even if you invest in a mutual fund that earns the same rate of return, in this case, where you're going to use a 6% rate of return, you can see it's almost a $20,000 difference over that 18 year period that you would have more for your child for college if you use that um, uh, tax advantaged account like a 529 plan. So what is a 529 plan? It's um, basically back in the early 2000s, uh, the 529 comes from the, the tax code and it was already existing, but the um, uh, IRS made a change and made the distributions from the 529 plans tax free. Prior to that, you would have to pay taxes on the interest that you earned on those accounts. And as a result, uh, every state in the country decided they had to have their own 529 college savings plan. And um, investment companies across the country, like Vanguard, Fidelity, American Funds, you name them, were clamoring to get into state capitals and be the investment company of choice for that state. Um, over the past 20 years, a lot's changed with those investments. Um, states have opted in and out of different types of, um, of uh, or different investment companies for their plans. Um, and there are a lot of reasons um, that uh, you would choose your state versus another state, and we'll get into that. So first of all, the basics of 529 plans is that uh, anyone can open an account. Um, as parents, you can open an account for your children. You could open an account for yourself if you wanted to, if you were planning on going back to college and name yourself the beneficiary. Um, it's really common for grandparents to, uh, to open up a 529 plan for their uh, grandchildren. And we'll talk about some advantages of doing that also later on. And I've even come across some situations where um, aunts, uncles have opened up accounts for their nieces and nephews. Um, other advantages are really high contribution limits. So basically, contributions to a 529 plan are determined by the gift tax rules. And so in 2020, you can gift $15,000 to uh, a child. So a parent so two parents could gift one fifteen thousand to the child, and the other parent could give fifteen thousand for a total of thirty thousand um, dollars. And then, of course, you have um, grandparents and other people that could also be gifting into the plan. Um, now, the there is a an account maximum for uh, for five twenty nine plans. It's a ridiculous number of five hundred and twenty thousand dollars. So once your account reaches that amount, you cannot contribute to it anymore. Uh, you can, it can continue to grow above that, but you can't make any more contributions. In my twenty years as a financial planner, I have only come across one family that has actually come to that um, that a cap. Um, and what's also interesting to know is that that cap is state by state. So let's say you are super wealthy, and we'd love to meet with you. Um, you could hit that five hundred and twenty thousand dollars in the state of North Carolina, and then open an account in a different state and start contributing to that. So. Uh, to say that there are high lifetime contribution limits, you could almost say they're unlimited. Um, as parents and grandparents, whoever opens the account, you control the funds, not the children. The children are beneficiaries um, who are the future students, college students. Um, and um, what's nice about a 529 plan is they're 
they're going to be they're going to seem very similar to your 401k plan that a lot of people have experience with picking investments in. You might have some individual investments you can choose from like individual mutual funds, but you can also buy packaged mutual funds which we're going to call here age-based portfolios. They work very similar to um target date retirement funds where you have um the port the investment company is going to put the investments your money into a portfolio based on your kid's age and as your child gets older and closer to the age 18 and the college age it's going to systematically be moving from more aggressive stock um positions and systematically move that more to bonds and um and so by the time the child is later in high school, it's reducing the risk and volatility within that account. And you don't have to do anything except continue to add money to it. Um, I mentioned that there are some significant 529 um, tax benefits. The first is the money that you put into a 529 plan, you're not going to get a 1099 or some sort of tax form each year telling you you have to you owe taxes on the gains that it's made, any capital gains um, that um, that's earned in that account. Um, and then once you reach uh, your child reaches college age and you're taking distributions, uh, those distributions will come out tax free if they're used for qualified higher education expenses. And of course, that's the everyone asks, well, what's a qualified higher expense, um, higher education expense? And, you know, for the most part, it's you think about your tuition, room and board, anything that's really needed for a course of study that the child's going to take. Uh, we get the question a lot of times about um, buying a car, for example. Those would not be considered uh, transportation. Like if your child goes to school in California, um, you know, airfare cannot be used from a 529 plan. Um, the other thing I was going to mention is about beneficiaries. Um, as a parent, you have, let's say you have a couple kids, you can change the beneficiary on the account. And um, I think some aunts and uncles and grandparents would like that flexibility also. So if a grandparent has an account um, for uh, a child and that child doesn't choose to go to college, um, hopefully they have several other grandchildren that uh, call them on a regular basis and, and um, maybe even email and text with them. And uh, they wanna change that beneficiary to that new grandchild that is available. Um, you can change a beneficiary to pretty much anyone in the family within the, let's call it the aunt, uncle, niece, nephew, cousin range. Okay, outside of that, uh, they would not be eligible to, to have that beneficiary change. Uh, one other thing about taxes that I wanted to make sure everyone understood is North Carolina does not have um, any specific uh, tax benefits for using the North Carolina plan. Uh, there are 16 states that offer no benefits. All the others actually offer some sort of a tax uh, deduction on contributions in state taxes. We used to here in, in North Carolina, but about five years ago, the state legislature took that away. Speaking of grandparents, um, so one other feature of the 529 plan is, as I mentioned, you could do $15,000 a year, but you can actually um, do five years of that $15,000 and sort of accelerate the funding. And so this is often done by grandparents who want to say, hey, I've got you know $50,000 that I want to give to the grandchildren. Um, you can open up 529 plans and they can put them all, put all five years of their $15,000 into uh, a 529 plan. Now, once they've done their five years, they can't contribute any more uh, to that account until that five year period is up. And then they could do it again for the next uh, five years later. Um, and another interesting fact about uh, 529 plans is, this is a very this is extremely unique in that a grandparent or a parent can take the money that is theirs, put it in the 529 plan for the child, and it, it leaves the um, the grandparents or the parents estate. So if that person passed away, it wouldn't be considered part of their estate. 
What's unique about the 529 plan is that grandparent could actually take that money back at some point in time. Let's say they, you know, need it for, they live longer than they expected. Um, they could actually take that money back and use it for themselves. Um, they would, and a parent could do that too if their children don't end up not going to college. Um, now you would have to uh, pay some taxes and penalties by bringing it back, but the key is that um, you get to keep control of that asset and you can bring it back into your estate. It is literally the only way anyone can do that. So uh, it's a really neat estate planning advantage. So here are some of the limitations um, that um, people might find with a 529 plan. Um, most of the investments you're going to put your money into are going to be in some sort of a variable return. Um, now, the state of North Carolina actually partners with uh, State Employees Credit Union, and they do have a fixed account, and a lot of other states do too, um, where you can put it into some sort of a money market account. Of course, you're not going to be earning a very good interest rate on that. And as I've mentioned, if college is going up at 5% and you're earning one, uh, you're going to be losing ground on, um, on that cost. Um, you're limited to the plan's investments. Uh, so it's important as you're choosing a 529 state to use, and you can use any state for the most part. There are a couple states that might limit it only to their, their citizens. But most states, you can pick and choose. Personally, I have, I have mine uh, at the state of Virginia because I like the investment manager there, and they have very good uh, portfolios and individual mutual funds that I can pick from, and that's run by American funds. Um, but you are limited to what's inside that, that state's plan. Um, throughout the year, you only change your investments twice. So earlier this year, when things got a little crazy in March, um, I'm looking at my eighth grader and I was thinking, I have everything in stock mutual funds for her uh, 529 plan. And I thought, you know what? I think I might put some of this in bonds. So I made a change. And, um, and when I called American Funds and I made the change, I was reminded that I only had one more change that year in her 529 plan. Um, so if you do make a move, understand that if I wanted for that money to go then back into equities after now we see things have kind of settled down a bit, then I wouldn't be able to move any more money in that account the rest of the year. Okay. Um, so if, if you don't use the money for, as I mentioned, qualified education expenses, you will pay uh, income tax on the earnings, what you've made, um, and a 10% penalty on those earnings as well. And some people might take a close look at the fees and expenses. Initially, when 529 plans first came out, um, there were some higher expenses in there. There are layers of fees because the states charge a fee, the mutual fund companies charge fees. So it's important to understand what those fees and expenses are. I can tell you that today, you shouldn't have to worry about that too much, um, but uh, we can help you with that if you want help um, looking into those costs. So the next type of account that has good tax advantages, and maybe you've heard of it, is a Coverdell Education Savings Account. Um, these kind of fell out of favor because prior to a couple of years ago, you could only put $500 a year into it. So most people thought, well, what's the point in opening an account uh, that I can only put $500 a year in it when you have a 529 plan that um, is, as I mentioned, almost unlimited in your contributions. Uh, now you can up, put up to $2,000 per year into a Coverdell account. Um, another advantage that Coverdell's had was you could use it for elementary, secondary, or college expenses. Well, earlier in the year, there was a tax law change, and now you can actually use some of the uh, 529 money for um, elementary and secondary school too. So it kind of takes away the advantage from the Coverdell in that aspect also. Um, the taxes are very similar to the uh, 529 plan. It's gonna grow tax deferred. And then when you use it for qualified expenses for college, it comes out tax free. Um, and similar, you'll pay a 10% penalty and taxes if you don't use it for those qualified expenses. Um, 
Now, the only difference is there is an eligibility uh, factor that you need to be aware of for uh, putting money into a covered L. Um, and I jotted this down, so apologize that I'm looking down at my notes. But your income limits, if you're married filing jointly and you earn more than $190,000, um, you'll be phased out for making that $2,000 uh, contribution up until $220,000. Once your income's over two twenty, dollars you can't put any money in there. Um, and then as a single person, uh, the income range is uh, $95,000 to $110,000. Um, those are pretty high numbers. So I'm sure there are a lot of people out there that could consider using an education savings account. Um, so my question would be, well, why would someone use that over the 529 plan? Um, I came up with two things that I think are um, are probably the, the two things you would consider. One is that um, you can you have more investment options with an education savings account, a Coverdell. For example, you could open up a Coverdell at the credit union and put it in a CD or a IRA savings account here at the credit union or most any bank for that matter. Um, on that's the conservative side. Now, on the risky side, if you were the type of person that wanted to invest your money for your kid's college into individual stocks, which are not available in a 529 plan, you could open up a Coverdell account and you could invest in individual stocks inside a, a brokerage account um, owned as a Coverdell. And then I did mention that... Um, that uh, 529s can be used for elementary and secondary school, but they're a little bit more limited. Um, there's a limit on how much you can use uh, from a 529 plan, but um, a Coverdell, there's no limit. You could use all the money for um, for primary school or secondary school. Um, so that those are the two things that I think if you really were thinking that you'd use the money for um, you know pre-college uh, or if uh, you wanted to invest in stocks, or something at the bank or a credit union. Now, Roth IRAs, um, we do get a lot of people that are interested in using Roth IRAs. Um, this helps some people um, you know, plan for their retirement and college at the same time. Um, so, you know, people are pretty familiar with Roth IRAs now. It's, it is a retirement savings vehicle. Um, you put the contributions in and like the 529 plan, it's going to grow tax deferred. Um, now, the difference is when you take the money out and you use it for college, um, if it is a qualified college expense, you won't pay the 10% early distribution. However, you will pay taxes on any gains that you made. So, for example, if you invested $10,000 in a Roth, it grew to $20,000 and you decided to use that full $20,000 for your child's college, $10,000, the gain that you made, would actually pay taxes on that. So, you know, there is a, that is, a, I think, a major drawback. Um, but for someone who can't decide if they want to open up a pure college savings account, um, or they haven't done that and they do have quite a bit of money in Roth, uh, you might consider using your Roth account uh, to pay for college. Um, one way I would do that if I were you, if this is a route that you wanted to take, is really just consider your contributions to that Roth IRA for college and then leave the gains that you've earned in there for your retirement because the contributions that you made to the Roth IRA are going to come out penalty-free and tax-free. Okay. Now, we do have to be concerned with um, income and contribution limits to a Roth IRA. And excuse me again for looking at my notes. Uh, but in 2020, uh, if you're married filing jointly and your income is over $196,000, you are going to start being phased out from making a contribution. Okay. Um, and single filer, that starts at $124,000. So if your income is below that, you should consider a Roth, even if you don't want to use it for college, you should be considering it for your retirement because Roth IRAs are awesome. Now, we do have some contribution limits, uh, as noted on the slide. For If you're under the age of 50, it's $6,000, and, and, and 50 and older is uh, $70,000. And by the way, for you folks like me who are turning 50 this year, it is the year that you turn 50. So you could put your contribution in before your actual birthday. Um, and of course, always consider the impact on your retirement if you do use that money for uh, for your kid's college. 
Um, all right, so here's kind of a chart of the different um, solutions for saving for college. And uh, the one we didn't cover is in the far right, mutual fund stocks. And I would even include their um, you know, money you have at the credit union, uh, savings and CDs. Because basically, you know, those are what we call a non-qualified account. It's not designated for any particular goal, like a Roth IRA or a 529 plan. Um, so, you know, there are some a lot of flexibility with working uh, specifically with just a traditional non-qualified account. Um, you know, obviously, you can put as much money in there as you want, um, and uh, you can open up a brokerage account and invest it however you want. Uh, you do lose the tax benefits. And if you recall the slide that I showed earlier in the presentation, uh, that cost that particular family $20,000 in college money in the, uh, the taxes they would have to pay on that account over the years. Um, another drawback, and we're going to get into this a bit, is the, um, the impact on financial aid. Uh, and that's in the second part of the, the presentation about how all these different accounts impact financial aid. And that should be a factor in deciding what kind of an account you open. But, you know, what I tell people, um, and I have friends and family, and what's the, what's the right way to go? And um, there's no one perfect strategy. Um, you know, family circumstances are going to be important. Uh, what's your income limit? Um, you know, what, how, how much importance do you put on college? It's interesting for me because my family, I can tell you a story um, years ago when my daughter was a toddler, uh, we met up with some college friends and they were asking me questions about 529 plans. And, and I made the comment, well, you know, if, if, you, if, if your kid doesn't go to college, um, you know, then you have to pay penalties and taxes um, on the money if, if you bring it back into your own account. And they all just looked at me in horror like their kids wouldn't go to college. Anyhow, so that's my friends, but I know that there are plenty of people out there that, um, you know, college isn't necessarily a given for their children, and nor is it a given that the parents are going to pay for it. Um, but what I would urge you to consider is um, is having some sort of a plan and think and talk about that with your family about what you're going to do. Um, and then what I would recommend is sitting down with one of our financial advisors and helping you um, come up with a strategy that fits what your goals are. Um, personally, what I've done is, is I've used the 529 plan, um, since my daughter was one years old, one year old. Um, and I wanted to use the 529 plan for those tax benefits. You know, if you're going to start saving for your kids college when they're young, the, uh, compounded interest and tax deferral really, really adds up. Um, what I'm planning to do later as she gets into high school is probably transition and, and put some money into one of these mutual fund um, savings account options here on the right side of the screen. Um, because I know that she's going to have expenses that aren't qualified educated education expenses, and I want to have a little bucket of money that I can use for those kinds of things like transportation, spring break costs. We all remember that. Um, you know, all those things are not going to come out of a 529 plan. So you could save some money in a taxable account uh, for those things. Okay, so we talked about um, your college savings. Now, how are we going to pay for it? And once we've saved all this money, um, you know, and that's not the only, as we can see on the slide, that's not the only thing we need to consider when it's time to pay is the college savings. Um, most people aren't going to save the full tuition for UNC or Duke for that matter. Um, so, uh, you know, I can tell you my experience. I think I touched every one of these boxes to get through my um four years of, um, of college. We got gifts from grandparents. Um, my parents uh, happened to move right before we, um, uh, before I went off to college. So they took out some equity from the house and uh, used that for my first year of college. Um, you know, we filed for financial aid and got lots of financial aid. Um, I came from a modest middle income family, so we actually qualified for uh, financial aid. Um, and then, of course, I did work, especially in the summer, and saved as much money as I could. Uh, and that was my spending money during school. But um, really, a lot of it's going to, for most people, they're going to look at their what they've saved. 
um, and they're going to be looking at um, uh, the financial aid package that they get when they fill out their FAFSA form. Um, what I would dissuade, the, the other borrowing options for me is a giant black box that too many people dip into. Um, and in that black box is their home equity. Uh, so they're borrowing money to, um, uh, to pay for their kids' college. They're going into their uh, 401k and, and taking money out of that, um, either as a loan or some people are even paying the taxes and penalties uh, and, um, and taking money out of their IRAs to pay for their college. Um, and we see that as a very last option and would love to help you think of different other creative ways. Um, Today, more so than when, when I was going to college, you know, almost 30 years ago, um, going, uh, this is under the creative cost cutting measures, um, more and more people are choosing to either get some of their college courses out of the way in high school. So much, so many high schools now are offering courses that are uh, partnered with the local community colleges. So you can get, um, in some cases, a whole semester out of the way. Um, and then a lot of other families are using one or two years of community college and then transferring into, uh, a f you know, finishing at a four-year university. And what's great about that is all your diploma says is, you know, NC State. It doesn't say that you took the first two years at um, uh, Wake Tech. It says you went to NC State and you got a four-year degree. Uh, and that's what's important. Um, so a lot of people are considering that as an option. And, you know, I read one article recently that showed you could save up uh, up to 40 percent of the total college tuition, which could add up to 30 or 40 thousand dollars just by taking a, a two years at a community college and then transferring. And by the way, you know, in those two years, your kids are actually kind of growing up a little bit and they might actually have a better idea what they want to do with their lives. And they might actually finish college with a degree that they want to do something with. So there are a lot of other advantages, not just financial to that. So let's get into the financial aid aspect um, of um, college planning. These are the basic um, um, attributes to any financial aid package. Uh, your loans, obviously, are money that you borrow and then have to pay back. And there are a variety of types that we're going to go over. Grants, as you know, are money that you receive and then don't have to pay back. Uh, and then scholarships, um, well, first of all, grants are uh, financially based or need based. So after you fill out your financial aid application, if, you know, if, if the school finds that you have a financial need, you would get a grant. Scholarships are merit based. So a scholarship is based on, you know, hey, you play the cello really well. So a school is going to give you a scholarship to go play the cello. Um, or you're an excellent soccer player, um, or you have some sort of academic uh, excellence. Um, so those are those are merit based, and those of course you don't have to pay back. Also, and then the fourth is work study. So those are jobs on campus that um, your income will go to the bursar's office, not your checking account that you can spend. It goes to paying uh, paying off your um, your tuition for that semester. Um, so using a net price calculator is the concept that you'll find when you start filling out your financial aid application. Um, and I want to give you guys another website that I found. It's um, called collegecost.ed.gov forward slash net dash price. And hopefully one of my teammates will uh, put that into the chat. But basically what this net price calculator will do is um, you can put in a college that your child is interested in. Um, it'll ask you to enter your assets, your income, um, and a variety of other information, like how many people live in your household, um, do you have other children in college? And what this will do is hypothetically tell you what a family like yours would pay based on what a similar family paid last year. So um, so it really does, without having to go through the full financial aid application process, I mean, you could even do it 
Now, I could do it now for my eighth grader just to get, have an idea. Uh, you don't have to have a senior in college to do this. And it'll give you an idea of kind of given what your income and your assets are, what you would expect um, to pay. Here's the financial aid process uh, simplified. Um, basically, um, you're going to, similar to what this net cost calculator is going to do, you're going to put in all your family information. A, um, oh, well, let's just call it what it is, a federal or institutional methodology. Institutional is the college. So sometimes colleges have their own uh, metrics that they use to evaluate you. To use the uh, the federal uh, that spits out is called your expected family contribution. Um, and one thing I want everyone to understand is is that um, that the um, that your income has a much greater impact than uh, than your assets. So just I'll give you a case in point, and once again, I look at my notes because I I found this on a website that I thought was interesting. Um, you know, so if you have a an income, a family income of one hundred twenty five thousand dollars and no assets, your expected uh, family contribution is twenty four thousand. So in this case, you would get, if you were that family, you would get almost no aid to, uh, to go to UNC. However, if your income was $75,000 and you had $100,000 just sitting in the bank that you could use to spend on college, um, your um, expected uh, family contribution is only $12,000. So you would get a potential aid package of another $12,000 to go to UNC. I thought that was really interesting, and, and I found that on a, another source that everyone could um, has access to, and it's um, J.P. Morgan College Planning fin um, Essentials. So if you just Google J.P. Morgan College Planning Essentials, you'll get more information about college planning than I could ever give you on this <laughs> on this presentation. But um, like I said, it's um, it's the financial aid process is. Um, can take is can be time consuming, but it's important that every family does it every year. Um, and a couple of really important things that everyone needs to know is that, and I learned this recently from talking to a um, uh, administrative um, admissions officer, is that um, the earlier you apply, um, the better, more likely is you're going to get a better aid package because they have a finite amount of money that they're giving out. And as they're bringing it, as they're taking in applications and accepting students, they're actually, you know, to accept somebody, then they have to consider what aid package they're going to give them. So they're doling those out. It's not like they're waiting until some end date and then they're figuring out who gets what. I thought that was really interesting and I had no idea. Um, Another very important thing to know about that is you can start filing your uh, FAFSA, which is the financial aid application, on October 1st. So what I, my takeaway here is for that, for anyone who's got kids who are juniors and seniors in high school, is that you definitely want to be filling out your financial aid application in October um, to be able to get the best package, uh, financial aid package from the colleges uh, that your children are applying for. Um, I think that was my, those are my huge takeaways on that one. Um, so when when we're calculate when you're calculating your um, your your assets that are available for college, some things are not going to be ex are, are not going to be included in that um, equity in your home definitely not included. Um, any retirement accounts that would be that would include your Roth IRA, your um, um, 401k plans, uh, traditional IRAs um, will not be included. Um, an, any kind of an annuity, because an annuity is a retirement account. Um, any cash value life insurance, if you have that old whole life policy or a universal life policy that has some cash value, it's not counted. Now, one thing that everyone needs to understand that is counted are 529 plan assets. So as parents, if you own that asset, um, then the... Um, 
that will be included as as an asset that's available for college, as it should be when you think about it. Um, now, let's take it one step further. If you have grandparents that have opened up accounts, those are not included. So, you know, you could have a grandparent with $100,000 in a 529 plan for your kid, and it wouldn't be considered in the financial aid application. However, there's a flip side to that. When the grandparents start taking money out of that 529 plan for the child, it shows up on the financial aid application as income to the child because it's almost as if you've given the money to the kid um, from the grandparent. So it shows up as income for the child. So my my main takeaway there for everybody is if you know you have grandparents who have money saved for their for your kids, um, use that money last, right? Because another point that everyone needs to understand is that um, there's a two-year lag on your income that is considered for the financial aid application. What's important to understand about um, when you're filling out your financial aid application, it, let's say we're here in, in um, you have a college senior who's going to be going to college next year, right, in the 2021-2022 school year. October 1 comes up and you're going to be filling out your financial aid application. You're going to be using income from your uh, 2019 tax return, okay? So they're going to be looking at your 2019 income to calculate what your aid package is going to be for your child who's not starting college until the end of 2021 going into 2022. Um, so it's really important for people to understand what, um, when, like for example, when I was using the grandparents who, when they take money out of the financial, uh, the 529 plan uh, for a grandchild, it's important that you know what year that's going to impact. So if you take that all out for your senior year, then it'll have no impact on their financial aid application, right? Because they're going to be done before you're filing, you know, when that income hits, it's not going to show up on any financial aid application in the future. So point is, if grandparents have uh, 529 plans, use them for the kids junior and senior year of college. Okay, so let's talk about loans. Um, so you have uh, basically um, uh, a few kind of loans that are specifically for college. Um, the federal loans come in two types. You have a subsidized loan, which basically means that while the kid's in college, um, the interest is not accruing on that loan and you don't have to make payments on it, okay? An unsubsidized uh, Stafford loan or federal student loan, um, interest is being accrued while the child is in college. So the question I'm sure everyone is wondering, well, how do you get the subsidized ones, right? So the subsidized ones are actually need-based. So after you fill out the financial aid application, if you qualify for financial aid, um, then you will also qualify for one of these uh, Stafford subsidized loans. Um, the amounts currently uh, range from $3,500 to $5,500 um, a year based on what year you are in school. So as you get further along in college, the amount that you can borrow actually goes up. Uh, the current interest rate that I found on it was 4.5%, which isn't terrible. It's not great. Um, obviously, we'd rather save the money and then not have to borrow, but 4.5% on a subsidized loan that you're not paying any interest on and it's deferred isn't that bad. Um, and then just for your information, the unsubsidized loans, um, they range from $5,500 to $20,500. So our next type of loan is a plus loan, and these are loans for parents who have high income, so they didn't qualify for any financial aid, but haven't saved, so they have to borrow money for their kid's college. And uh, there's basically the limit on the amount that you can borrow is the, um, is the cost of the college um, that you borrow. You, you take it out each year. So basically the college is going to say, hey, you owe us $25,000 and you go to the bank and you say, okay, I need a $25,000 loan plus loan. 
Um, the interest rate currently is around 7%, um, which is pretty high, truthfully. Um, and um, the other th important thing on that is um, there's no deferral. You're paying interest on it, and you have to make payments on it even while the kid's in, in college. Um, and you should have a you have to have a decent credit score. They're not going to just give it to anybody. OK. And then you have private student loans, uh, which you can get from a bank or a credit union um, that offer student loans. Um, they are issued to the student, to the child, and the child has to pay those back. Um, I'm not sure what the interest rates are on those these days. Uh, so that's something you'd have to look into and be aware of excess loans. I tell you, we see people I was just looking at a case today where if uh, parents were um, uh, paying $185,000 of, of student loans and the kids are out of school and the parents are actually entering retirement um, with $185,000 of student loan debt for their children. So, you know, plan ahead if you're young and if you're older, let's get creative. We'll help you figure out a way to do it without having to borrow too much money. So how much should you rely on? Um, one thing that I've read uh, in that JP Morgan um, guide to college is that college costs, while we know they have been going up significantly, the financial aid that's been distributed over the past 10 years has actually gone down. So as college costs are going up, the aid that's available is going down. Uh, so we really can't rely too much on financial aid. Um, a lot of people we hear, you know, they want to, they think their kid's a great soccer player or volleyball player. Um, I found a statistic that only 2% of high school athletes get any kind of scholarship. I'm not talking about a full ride to Stanford. We're talking about any dollar amount in a scholarship, only 2% of high school athletes. So you really can't rely on that. Um, and, uh, and it's important that, that you plan ahead basically. And, um, so that's the end of the uh, presentation on college planning. Uh, what I wanna bring it back to is basically how we can help you here at Coastal. Um, as the Director of Financial Planning and Certified Financial Planner, I work with our eight financial advisors who um, help our members put together a comprehensive financial plan that encompasses their insurance needs uh, and protection. Um, making sure that if they have children, they want them to go to college, that we have a plan in place for them. And of course, retirement and uh, making sure that it all works together. Um, here's our process. And as you know, with um, in this era of COVID-19, we're not doing a whole lot of in-person meetings, but uh, we are doing meetings over the phone and using WebEx, for example. Um, we've had some members that want to set up a Zoom meeting with us, and we'll do that too. Whatever you want to do, whatever platform is best for you. But, um, you know, help, you know, schedule an appointment with one of our advisors. Um, Tiffany, who's on the on the call today, will send out a, a profile, help you fill out your, um, uh, you know, just kind of compile what you've done to date to save for your goals. Um, and then you're going to have a meeting with that financial advisor and um, talk about, your assets that you've accumulated, your income, what your goals are, uh, make sure we understand what you want to accomplish. And then we're going to schedule a follow-up meeting uh, to go over our recommendations after we've put the financial plan together for you. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, if you don't implement the plan, then um, it was a good exercise and you know what hurdles are ahead of you. But it's important then to take that last step to put that plan in place. And uh, we'd love to help you with that. And then, of course, you become a client here um, in our wealth management group. Then um, we're going to review that with you regularly and make sure that you stay on track. I just wanted to point out, you know, I know that college planning isn't the only thing that you're thinking about with your finances. So we do have a number of um, webinars uh, that we're going to be presenting coming up. And uh, so if you go to uh, coastal24.com and uh, under plan and learn, you'll find the wealth management website and, um, and a list of our upcoming webinars that you can participate in. Um, before we get into the Q&A session, I just wanna thank everyone for joining the call today. Um, you're gonna get an email tomorrow with um, uh, a survey and we really appreciate you filling that out. Let us know how we did. 
Uh, we want to continue to do these webinars and we want your feedback. Uh, we've been doing them basically since March, right, Evelina? Since uh, um, we were all sent home and uh, we've gotten a lot of great feedback and we've improved um, how we've presented these. And in fact, um, we had our little glitch in there when someone was able to join in. We're going to be using a new WebEx software for the, our future webinars where um, we're going to have a little bit more control over, um, over those types of things. And I think you'll appreciate that as a process. Um, I'd like to bring on uh, Rick and Jonah, two of our financial advisors um, who have been monitoring our chat, and they're going to help us answer any questions that I didn't cover in the presentation. Hey, thanks a lot for the great information, Drew. Hi, this is Jonah Kaufman, one of the financial advisors that's been helping out with the chat today. Uh, Drew, there were a couple of questions that came up in the chat that we deferred till the end, and so I just want to be um, I want to help out and see if we can address those first. There was a question that came up about using like a trust. I assume it's a UTMA or UGMA versus using a 529. Drew, do you have any thoughts on the pros and cons of one versus the other? Uh, yeah. So um, the the um, a custodial account or a UTMA account is basically an account that is uh, the parents have gifted some money to the child. Um, and um, so it is the child's money. And a couple drawbacks with that is it's um, it's not tax deferred. Um, you know, it's going to be taxed at the child's tax rate, which isn't significant, but it can be as they get older and if you accumulate a decent amount of money in there. So it's not tax deferred like a 529 plan. Um, the other thing is that um, once the child turns 18 or you can say age 21, that is the child's money and they can literally do whatever they want with it. So, you know, you may have a big plan for them to go to college and they have a bigger plan to buy that new Corvette. So, um, you know, and it's their money to do that with if they want to. So there, I think the two main drawbacks of the, of the, the um, custodial account or the UTMA is the tax issue. Um, and then it's really the child's asset and they can do whatever they want with it once they be, reach the age of majority. Obviously, you have some advantages there. You know, if the kid's not college bound, then they can do anything. They could start a business. You know, they can do whatever they want with that money. And it's not tied to specifically to college uh, funding. And um, like we were talking about with some of the other investments, you can choose how to invest that. You can go into a brokerage account. You can invest it all in Apple stock if you wanted to. Um, but um, so that's one advantage also over the 529 plan, which is more of a mutual fund and, and portfolio type account. Um, one of the other questions that came in that we deferred to the end here was, um, can you use 529 plan money to offset, offset rent and food costs if you're not living on campus? That's a great question. Actually, you cannot. Um, so 529 money technically is only for room and board um, on campus. So yeah, if you have a student who, you know, in their junior, senior year move off campus, um, you cannot use the 529 plan money for that. So this is Jonah again, and thank you for that answer there. Um, the couple of questions that came in regarding costs associated with using a coastal financial advisor as well as um, fees for going through the financial plan assessment and recommendation, if so, how much. So Coastal believes, and it's our philosophy, that our members should have access to sound financial planning. And so there is no cost to, to go through a college assessment or a retirement planning session that involves us using some of the latest technology in the industry as well as um, looking at your specific need, asking the right questions in the front end, to make sure that as well we deliver the information that's relevant to your questions. So we'd be glad to do that. Um, there are sometimes fees associated with actually investing with us. And these fees are going to be indicative to the investments and the investment recommendations the financial advisor makes. The financial advisors will cover any sort of costs or fees to the client. 
as long as there aren't any costs, but certainly to go through a plan with us, there are no costs. There's not a fee or a $500 an hour that we see some firms charging. Good questions. Do you have one, Rick? It's Drew, yeah, one more popped up here at the end. Um, I think it's a really good question. Is student tuition considered a qualified expense for 401k withdrawals or Roth IRA withdrawals? Yeah, tuition is for sure. That is a um, higher education expense, yeah. We do have one more question. If one of you, Jonah or Rick, could address this one with Drew, that'd be great. The question is that um, I assume the financial advisor, your fiduciaries, absolutely. Uh, we are fiduciaries and subscribe to a financial planning process with all the engagements with the members that we work with and speak with. Yeah, just, just to add to and that, Jonah, um, we we have, um, you know, our licenses um, as an investment advisor require us to act as a fiduciary. So it's not just the coastal philosophy. We literally have to, um, based on our FINRA licenses that we hold. That too. Yep. Hey, Drew, one other question um, that we defer to the end here regarding all of the 529 questions that came in today, do they also apply to Roth withdrawals? Um, I don't think I understand the question. <laughs> Sorry. I think what she's asking is um, the qualified expenses on a 529 plan for higher education. Does that also apply if you're taking money out of a Roth IRA to use it for? College. Oh, oh, yes. I believe that I is true. The question is just... Yes, I, I understand that question. I think that is true, but I'll, I'll be honest with you. Uh, before I, you know, pulled money out of a Roth IRA, I would definitely be double checking to make sure, you know, with the IRS tax code that it's it's covered. Um, we've run into that situation. Jonah and I were de dealing with that earlier this year, where people wanted to take money out of, you know, qualified account or. Um, 529 counts to pay for cars and things like that. And, and even some other grayer areas that, that we had to look into. So um, it's important if you're going to make a, some, if you're going to do something other than your, your standard tuition room and board check, I would definitely be double checking to make sure that it's covered. And there was a lot, one last question that came in at the end. If I can pull money out of my IRA for tuition, is there any advantage of having a 529 for tuition? Um, yeah, well, I guess I guess the primary advantage is that you're not using your retirement money for your for your college. And I don't know if this is it sounds maybe like somebody who is using it for themselves, not a child. Like maybe they want to get a graduate degree or something. Um I'm not sure, but um uh, so if it's somebody who's saying, hey, I want to start graduate school next year, and they're looking at, like, where to get the money to pay for it, um, you know, and all they have is an IRA, well, you know, that may be your only choice. But um, but if you're planning on saving money in an IRA versus uh, a 529 plan, um, you know, I would definitely not – I would definitely not use the IRA, Um I would first use a Roth IRA if they're eligible, because at least the contributions that you put in there for a Roth IRA would come out tax-free and no penalty. So I guess the follow-up to that from the member is, oh, so I cannot pull money out of my IRA for my child's tuition. Uh, and actually, and but the... Just to be clear, when you take Drew, you're freezing in and out a little bit. Um, Rick, can you and Jonah manage that question? Yeah, I believe that what Drew is going to say is when you're taking money out of the IRA, it is still taxable, and you can use an amount for qualif or for a educational purposes for you are a qualified dependent, but at the end of the day, you know, you're still going to take taxes out of, or you're still going to pay taxes if it's a traditional IRA. If you're pulling your contributions out of a Roth, those were already taxed before you made the contribution. 
So you may not pay taxes on those, but certainly you would pay taxes on the distribution from your IRA. You would not pay a penalty, is my understanding, on the distribution if used for the education expense for you or, or an eligible dependent. That is correct, yep. Looks like your audio is back up okay, Drew. You froze there for a little bit. Um, it looks like that's our final question. So let's go to the last slide and thank our members and guests um, for right. attending there today. Was one last one that clarified the previous question, and I do think it's relevant here. So um, it says lots of folks ask questions about paying for college costs out of 529s. Uh, Drew answered it as if we, I was referring to taking money out of my Roth for college costs. For ex example, Drew stated that 529s cannot be used for off-campus housing. Can it be used for off-campus housing out of a Roth? Can a laptop be purchased out of a Roth? So where you're able to use the 529 for certain expenses like a laptop, can you purchase the same expenses, i.e. a laptop, when you take distribution from your Roth, or is it only limited to tuition? I believe that's what the question is. Catherine, let us know if we missed that. Yeah, yeah, I hear, I, I hear the question. And, and um, you know, first of all, uh, yeah, so off-campus housing is not a qualified um, higher education expense. So it wouldn't be, so if you took money out of your Roth IRA to pay rent, um, it, it would not qualify and you would pay a 10% penalty. And the same is true for the laptop, unless that laptop is required for your course of study. For example, if you have a kid who goes into some sort of a, um, uh, like computer design or something like that, or, or um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, where they need like a, a fancy Apple to, to do their work or something, then you might be able to get that as a qualified expense. But just to go out and buy a, a, um, a laptop, um, honestly, is, is not considered a qualified expense. And so it wouldn't, you couldn't use a Roth or a 529 tax-free or penalty-free to buy either of those things. Thank you for that. And thank you so much for everyone attending today. Um, we will be sending out a brief survey tomorrow uh, mm -hmm. about our webinar. We'd love your feedback. It only helps us get better. And we will have a chance to be, or you will have a chance to be randomly selected for um, one of two Amazon $50 e-gift cards. Uh, we will contact you directly if you're the lucky winner. We would love to set up some time to review your education planning, financial planning, or just any other uh, retirement or wealth-related needs that you have. You can reach us best at 919-882-6655, wealthmanagement at coastal24.com or www.coastalwealthmanagement24.com. Once again, thank you very much, and we hope you have a wonderful day. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we appreciate you being on our session today. We hope you found it valuable. Um, and we will have a follow-up email sent to you if, if Tiffany didn't already send it. And certainly let us know if you have any questions that we can further help you address. Enjoy the rest of your day. At this time, I will go ahead and uh, turn off the session.